Friday to the uh, to the first first ever uh, Zoom meeting of a CBL. Uh, it, uh, it's not the way we'd like to do it, but we're, we're thankful we can do it this way. It, it's really good to have. And, uh, um, okay, so uh, Tim Meeker, uh, pastor at Salem Lutheran, is going to lead us in a prayer. And I don't know if any of y'all have heard, I know some of you have heard him preach, but uh, he's awesome. So if you haven't, you need to either do it live on, online or go to Salem and hear him. He has a, just an awesome job. So Tim, if you would uh, lead us, I'd appreciate it. You bet. It's always good to see everybody. Thanks for uh, the invitation. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Hey, God, we thank you for uh, the privilege of being able to gather together today. I thank you that we live in a day and a time where we don't have to, with any hesitation, reach out to you and be able to bow our heads and be reminded of the fact that there's a God and we are not him. And so I'm grateful for everybody that's on this call today. I thank you for Robert and the words that you put on his heart to share with us and the leadership that he gives in our community and in particular our, uh, our town. Uh, we love our town and we love the opportunity to be able to be involved. We ask that you would be with all the business owners that have been deeply, deeply affected over the last number of weeks in the middle of this pandemic. We ask you to protect uh, the lives of our citizens, continue to be with our leaders nationally, stateside, locally, uh, continue to give them great discernment as we seek to lead through this unprecedented time. We thank you for the fact that even through all of that, that there's one who uh, guides us and directs us, and that's you, and that you promised to hold us in the palm of your hand. I'm reminded of your words to the disciples before you ascended back into heaven, and you said, surely I'll be with you always to the end of the age. God, that's what we hang on to in moments like these, is the fact that uh, you're with us. And so we thank you for that. It's a blessed time that we share this afternoon. This we ask you in your precious and holy name. Amen. Man. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. So, so the CBL board is is trying to figure out how how to move forward here and you know when to meet and all of that. Uh, Lone Star College is going to be closed for the summer to all outside uh, events. So we, when we do get back together, it won't be at Lone Star, at least not in the summertime. But um, I don't know if he if Greg has made it on yet. But Church One Thirty Seven has graciously agreed that uh, anytime we can't meet at Lone Star, we can meet at uh, at Church 137, where we met, uh, I think it was in uh, in March, we met there. Um, and it's a, it's a great facility, and we appreciate it so much. If, if you're on with us, Greg, appreciate that. And, and the key, of course, is going to be how to get together safely. That's going to be the uh, the challenge, and we'll be working on that. And, uh, and anybody's input, we sure welcome that. If anybody has anything you'd like to recommend to us or share with us, we'd, we'd sure appreciate uh, you doing that. And so I know we have a number of people that are first time at, at CBL. I've got a bunch of RSVPs of people that I don't know, uh, haven't seen before. So I just want to mention that, that we meet the second Tuesday of every month, uh, usually at Lone Star, but uh, not right now. And um, we have a sponsor every month. And this month, uh, uh, Spirit of Texas Bank is sponsoring us, and we want to thank uh, Dave McIver for that. Um, we we have sponsorships available. If anybody's interested in sponsoring a month, it, it, uh, it's one hundred fifty dollars to sponsor a luncheon, and we would really appreciate that. And also, as everybody else, we have ongoing uh, expenses, and so if anybody would like to make a donation during this time when we're not getting together uh, physically, uh, we would welcome that. And we're working on how to. How to do that? We'll have a, a PayPal account set up real soon, and, and we'll put it on the website and let you know about that. Uh, and any other way that, uh, that we can do that. I want to mention that uh, our speaker for April, uh, James Morrison, I talked to him, and we had to cancel him. He said he will definitely speak to us uh, next year. We're full for this year, but he definitely will will speak to us. And uh, Jim Poe, our speaker for next month is willing to do a Zoom meeting if we don't get together. Uh, so that's good. And then in July, we have a problem because Hank and his kingdom dogs will, uh, will be our uh, speaker. And it won't make sense to do it via Zoom meeting. Uh, Zoom just won't work with, with the dogs. So hopefully we'll be back face-to-face uh, -face by July. That's, that's what we're hoping anyway. And uh, we'll get Hank to come and, and do his thing. He's changed his routine, if anybody's seen it, over the years, I've seen it about 10, 15 times, and he's changed it up uh, so it'll be a little bit different than we've seen in the past uh, going forward. So let's hope that we can get him in, uh, get him in, and get everybody together uh, in, in July. And so now Lori is going to introduce our speaker, Rob. And uh, Lori, do you want to meet yourself? Thank you. 
Ra. And Ra came to us in 2008 as, oh, he's leaving now. He's over here. <laughs> <laughs> in 2008, after 20 years as a captain with the Los Angeles Police Department. And he came to Tama as our chief of police, where he served six and a half years. And then as our assistant city manager in 2014 to 2018, and then he was asked to serve as our city manager, which he's been doing a great job ever since April 2018 when he did that. He has a master's degree in management, summa cum laude, John Hopkins University. He's married to his lovely wife, Kathleen, and they have a beautiful blended family, and he is a perfect fit for Texas because of his big heart. So. Say hello to Rob House. So, so Rob, I, I want to get again, how do I make it so you're highlighted on our screen? What do you got there? I'm just validating that I have a big Texas heart and that I was right for Texas and I just took off a boot to show you guys that it's legit and there's even horse poop on them. So I'm just, I'm just making it clear that I have really fully immersed myself and, uh, and I was meant to be here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, I do believe that I was meant to be here, but it wasn't by my choice and uh, and that it was really me finally for the first time in, in my life actually listening um, listening to God, even when I didn't realize that I was uh, that I was listening to God. But so, so uh, Rob, Rob, can I interrupt you for a second? How do I make it, how do I make it so you're you're uh, highlighted on the screen and, and if you on your screen go to speaker mode up in the right corner, then you should see whoever's talking big ah. in the center of your screen and everybody else will be on top. And if somebody else unmutes and starts talking, they'll take over the screen. Got it. All right. You ready for me? Sure. All right. Well, I got to tell you, um, number one, um, you have no idea how much I, I mean, I'm humbled by Lori reaching out and asking me to, uh, to, to speak to y'all. I, um, you know, I look at the list of people and, and so many of you, um, I know and um, and have relationships with which uh, which I'll certainly weave into uh, to this discussion because that is one of the the things that makes this a special place. Um, it's one of the things that uh, that um, I think Jesus talks about most is relationships, and he and he taught us that with these twelve people that were a bunch of misfits that uh, that uh, that came together and and changed this world. Um, but uh, but I, uh, um, but I'm, I'm humble because, you know, I sit here and, and I reflect on, on my life and the fact that, uh, that I have, I, I sometimes jokingly say I've eaten government cheese my whole life. Um, I, uh, I've been in public service my entire adult life, whether it was in the army, whether it was in the Los Angeles police department, working for the city of Los Angeles or for the, uh, you know, the city of Tomball. And, um, and so, you know, I have not been a business owner, but I will, I will start by telling you that there is no greater, more important group of people um, in America that I respect than, uh, than business owners. Um, you're the ones who, who take a chance with your own capital. You're the ones that, that your employees don't realize it, but you have sleepless nights making, you know, wondering how you're going to make the payroll sometimes. And these are things that are so taken for granted by so many um, that I just want you guys to know that I truly am with every fiber in me, um, absolutely humbled by, uh, by having the opportunity, um, to share with you. Um, Lori shared really kind of the, the highlights of my, my professional, um, at least titles that I've, that I've held. Um, but I want to, uh, I want to kind of take a walk back in, in my early life and, and, uh, and I don't want to bore anybody. And, and if you have any questions along the way, or if I really get boring and see people start sleeping on the on the screens i'll uh, i'll know to do something to wrap it up quick but i but i do want to start um when when uh, when paul asked me to speak he did ask about my faith journey a little bit and and so that has to start where it begins um and it begins early in my in my life um i will tell you as i share my story um this is in no way meant for you to feel pity for um for me um that's not what this is about what this is about as i share this is about the way that God has worked in my life um, along the way and how I hope to highlight, because this isn't about me. This is about, like Tim said, this is about the words that God's, God puts on my heart. 
I will tell you that I threw a little outline together, just scratching some things out so I don't wander all over the place. But um, I really do hope that this really is about God using me to share with you um, to help um, just to help encourage and help us be better disciples and those things that, uh, that God tells us we're to do. But my life starts out, um, you know, as a, uh, as a, as a, a boy that was, uh, that was born to a, a teenage mother in high school, um, in Southern California. Um, she, uh, she was a, a senior in high school. Um, she then married my dad immediately in what we would all call a, a shotgun wedding. He went off in the Navy to Vietnam. I was born in December of 66, so it was right during the Vietnam War. Um, he was gone for a year, um, and then they lasted for a year once he came back. And then by the time I was two years old, they were, uh, they were divorced. Um, right about the time when I was, it was time to go into kindergarten, my grandfather and grandmother who lived in Indiana, my mom's um, uh, dad and stepmother, um, my, my grandpa had told my mom, you know, Laura Lee, um, this is not the place for, for Rob to be raised in. Um, you're bouncing from house to house. You're working as a cocktail waitress. Um, you, you just barely got out of high school. And so, uh, so my grandfather talked to his daughter and my mom and said, hey, he needs to come here to Indiana. He needs to, to stay with us, visit you in the summers. And then once you get your feet under you, then he'll, uh, he'll come back. And and um, and thankfully, my mom listened to uh, to her dad, and um, and so I was moved to Indiana, where I was raised from basically kindergarten um, through or t until eleventh grade, through tenth grade. Um, didn't know growing up <clears throat> that I was um, that I was raised in a poor household. It's interesting. It was only after I later looked back on my life growing up with my grandparents in a small rural farming community in central Indiana um, that they barely made ends meet, but I never realized it because I always had food on the table. I always had um, a shelter over my head and, and God was in our life from, from the earliest that I, that I ever remember. Um, my great grandfather, um, who was, I was blessed to be raised around, was an elder in our church. My grandfather and grandma were active in our, in our church. And, um, and again, as I look back, I was raised in a loving Christian environment. But compared to a lot of people, they would say, ooh, but you didn't have, have much. Well, you know what? I had clothes. They just weren't the nicest clothes. But I didn't know it as a kid. I was tearing them up anyway. Um, you know, I ate well because we were pretty self-sufficient. We raised our own animals and, 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 uh, and vegetables. And we had a cellar. And we froze things. And we did all those things to, to get by. But again, that was just normal to me. It's all I knew. What I also didn't realize was unusual was going to, to Kroger and actually going to the back of the store. And as a little guy being boosted up into the dumpster, and I was tossing out all the vegetables, because you may not know it, but when lettuce looks bad, if you peel off the first couple of layers, it's just a smaller head, but it's perfectly fine underneath. Um, when there's a worm in an apple, if you cut the worm off, the rest of the apple's just fine. And so, so I grew up in, uh, in that, that environment um, where I'd never felt like anything was missing because it wasn't. And... Um, and so I was so thankful to be to be raised in a in a in a, a Christian home. Unfortunately, my um, my grandfather, who absolutely was a devout Christian, um, was also um, he was chased by demons. Um, the devil is alive, well, and working. And I think oftentimes the closer we get to God, the more the devil's working on us. Because you see, if if you're not in step with God, the devil has no reason to bother with you. But when you are, he starts working on you. And my grandfather, um, early in his life, was a honky-tonk singer, a country singer, um, barely made a living in bars, um, singing and picking the guitar. And, and, uh, but before he moved me to Indiana, he had been on the, um, on the wagon. He hadn't drank. And for all those years, until my 10th grade year, he didn't have a drink of alcohol. And one day, he had one drink of alcohol. And the next thing I remember, um, this was over time, but the next thing I remember was my grandfather um, driving away from our house um, or walking towards his green van with me as a young teenager, um, begging my grandfather not to leave and him driving away never to return to our home again and, and stranding my grandmother and I there. Um, but we made ends meet. Um, she went to work. And I actually illegally 
drove myself to, to school and to the feed store and did those things until that summer between 11th, 10th and 11th grade, I visited California and my mom forced me to stay in California. I was mad. I rebelled. Um, I, I felt like I was abandoning my grandmother um, and, uh, and I didn't want to be there. Um, but I stayed. And, um, and at that moment in my life, I pretty much repelled God. I was mad. Um, I did not want to be there. And, um, and I just ignored um, God and God was not a part of my life at all. Not in church, not in youth group, not in prayer, not in reading the Bible, nothing. Um, I just walked away. Um, and I did everything I could to get myself kicked out of high school. Um, probably even came close to getting arrested. Um, I just was a rebellious teenager for those last two years of high school because I was just mad at the world. Um, but it was as I barely graduated high school that I, that I realized that, uh, if I didn't take care of me, nobody else was. And so, um, I went, uh, I, I joined the army and, and I, um, it was during basic training that I, that I kind of got my head screwed on straight and realized that I better, I better focus on, on making something of, of myself. And, and it was then actually that I, um, that I got involved with the chaplaincy corps in the army and actually for the first time went back to church and it was at basic training and then my advanced training in the, uh, in the army when I kind of got reacquainted, um, with God, when I was the prodigal son who, who came home and, uh, and God wel welcomed me back, um, back home. And, um, and so it was out of that experience that I realized that I wanted to go into public service and I, and I, um, I uh, applied for the Los Angeles Police Department. We're fast forwarding a little bit. I applied for the Los Angeles Police Department and um, a bunch of people told me, you're never gonna get hired by the LAPD. You know, um, affirmative action's crazy. It was 1980, or uh, yeah, 1988. Um, and I said, well, you know what? I don't care what's going on. I'm at least gonna apply and let them tell me no. You're not gonna tell me no. And so, uh, and so I did. And um, I went through the process and I got hired. And, um, and I was just incredibly thankful that I found a career that I loved. Now, I had some bad days, but I really did love every day of it. Um, I loved serving people. I loved having a stable job. I loved the, the paramilitary experience with, with a level of order and hierarchy. Um, I loved serving. And, um, and for 20 years, um, I did it and I, and I, and I worked hard to do it, to do it well. Um, I was fortunate. I, I rose through the, uh, the ranks of the LAPD and in 2006 had the opportunity to travel to uh, Texas A&M University with, uh, with some folks from LA Fire. Um, and so uh, I went to Texas A&M. Um, they have a program there called Teeks Disaster City. They're, they're well known around the world for some of the best emergency management training there is. And I had the opportunity in 2006 to, uh, to go to Teeks at Texas A&M. And, and, and when, I, when I got the word that I was gonna be going to this two-week course, um, I had a very close family friend who had, who had uh, grown up with me in California. Um, his mom was, was friends with my mother. And so we were very close. And so um, I knew he had moved to Texas, but I didn't even know where. And I called him up and said, hey, are you anywhere near this place called College Station, Texas? And he said, yeah, I'm in a place called Magnolia, Texas, and it ain't all that far away. And, and so I, I, extended my, I extended my trip and, and, uh, and visited him. And it was as I visited him in 2006 that I didn't recognize it then, but, but he showed me around Magnolia and Tomball and this area of the, of the greater Houston region. And, and there was something about it that, was, that felt familiar and felt comfortable and felt good. It was a community where I felt that uh, the people weren't afraid to invoke the name of God in a conversation where, um, where um, political correctness had not run completely off the rails and, and, and where this thing called community really meant something. And, and so um, I didn't realize it initially but I knew I liked it. I knew it felt good. I knew it felt comfortable. And I went back home and then it was over those next two years that I continued to visit a couple of times um, each year in the area. And I just grew more fond. And then it was in December of 2007 in a visit um, before Christmas 
that I said, you know what? I don't want to grow old in Los Angeles. Now, this made no sense whatsoever. I didn't really give it a lot of thought. And I'm a guy that usually gives things, um, you know, I'm a critical thinker. I'd like to think. I, I plan things out. I don't typically act recklessly, um, but I did act a little recklessly. I just decided in December of 2007, without a lot of planning, to put money down on a house in Magnolia, Texas, in Thousand Oaks subdivision off 1488. And I went back home and real, to California and realized I just bought a house. And, and, and realized that I didn't have a job and realized that I couldn't even retire from the LAPD until June of 2008, yet my house was gonna be finished in January, February of 2008. Um, but I, uh, I just had decided that I, I was eligible for retirement in June and I could consult, but I was moving to Texas because that's, and I didn't know why. It made no sense whatsoever. And, but it makes all the sense in the world at the same time. But, uh, um, but I, did, uh, I did continue to really then follow um, the local newspapers, then the Tribune and the Potpourri. And, and there was a, a point where I saw an article that Michael Blake, the chief before me, was leaving Tomball PD and going to the Austin area to become a chief of police. And, and I thought to myself, I wonder if they'll, if they'll do an, a nationwide search for chiefs. Because, heck, I'm going to be their neighbor anyway. Um, and so, sure enough, um, I watched and they did. They did a national search. Um, I applied. But then, of course, I thought, look, I haven't looked for a job in 20 years. Um, I, uh, I know they'll never hire a guy from Los Angeles. But you know what? Kind of like when I joined the LAPD, they're going to have to tell me no. I'm not going to make it easy for them. And so, um, so I, I applied. And me and a, about 100 other people applied. and and went through the process and and ultimately um i was asked to be the uh the chief of uh, of police um and in fact i think it's it's interesting that that lori's husband david was my boss then and now she's one of my bosses today i think that's a wonderful irony but uh um so he's to blame and you're to blame as well um but uh um but i did i i i was i was asked to join and uh the tomball team and the, the, the city manager then said, can you start June 2nd? So we had gone through this process that started in about April and it ended up in May. And she said, can you start June 2nd? And what she didn't know was that June 2nd was the first day I was eligible for retirement from the Los Angeles Police Department. And so I didn't miss a single day of work. And on that day, June 2nd, I was technically a Los Angeles police captain and the chief of police in Tomball, Texas. I will tell you that it, again, it made no sense for me to leave a job then that was paying me about $170,000 a year to start here at $100,000 a year. It, it didn't make sense for me to leave um, the commanding officer of Metropolitan Division, which was our 400-person special operations division for the LAPD that had citywide response through SWAT, canine, mounted, underwater dive team, waterborne assault team. I had the coolest job in policing anywhere in the world. And yet I was drawn. It didn't make sense. I didn't understand it until, until later. But I came here in June and, and I immersed myself in this community and this community welcomed me. Um, I found that, that this community, and I tell everybody I have the opportunity to, that what you give to this community, it will give back to you tenfold. And that's been one of the, the greatest experiences that I've ever had in my life is just to, to realize what it really is to be a part of community and to experience that as an adult, as an adult, not a kid. Um, and so, and so I came here as the, uh, as the, as the police chief and, and had that opportunity. I will tell you when I, when I, when I was one of the five finalists, I came here and I just started cold calling and knocking on doors. And the first door that I walked through, I came three days early before the assessment center. And the first door I walked through was the chamber office. And one of the first people I met was somebody who you, who you spoke about, who I love the fact that he can't even unmute himself and he can't even talk. And I can just talk about him all I want. Um, but that is, that is Bruce Hillegeis and Brandy was there as well. And the first question they asked me, and it was so out of context, and I love this now, but it was so out of context, it almost caught me off guard. 
is they looked at me and one of them, I don't remember who said, so what do you think about parades? And I thought, well, that is the most odd question I've ever heard in my life. But what response other than to say, and this is exactly what I said to him, duh, who doesn't love a parade? And right there, right then, I had Bruce and Brandy's vote for police chief. They knew everything was going to be okay. And, uh, and we have had one of the most amazing relationships, really, all three of us, and including my bride. Um, but, uh, but I think it's interesting that, that when I think about the lessons that, uh, that God taught us and continues to teach us, when I think about relationship, when I think about love, um, Bruce and I tell each other, and me and many of you, um, that we love each other. And, and we couldn't mean that. That couldn't be more real. Um, I absolutely, genuinely love so many people in this community and, and have learned through being a part of this community what brotherly love really is supposed to look like, what it's supposed to feel like. And I think, that, uh, I think that's one of the amazing things that's, that's so special. Um, I've had the opportunity to um, work in this community my wife was an active member of the chamber. She's a chamber. She's a former um, board chair. Um, she was actively involved in business in the community for years until about three or four years ago. She was able to 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 stop working and, and be at home and take care of the kids and and me. Uh, two of our kids and our blended family of three, um, we've been able to raise through the Tomball School District. Um, our last one, our youngest, Maddie, will graduate from Tomball High School this year. Um, our middle one, Connor, is a, uh, is a sophomore at Texas A&M in the engineering school. And, and so we've been able to work here. We've been able to raise our family here. We've been able to go to church and worship here. Um, we've developed friendships. And, and, it, and it's interesting that this is a community where, if you're willing, you can build friendships with anybody from all walks of life. I think, that, I think, I think of, of la just last night. Um, you know, we were in a, uh, in a council meeting, we had a special meeting and, and there was, again, this person who happens to be on this, um, in this meeting, um, Lori and Lori's there as a council member and one of my bosses and Lori and I get into a, a conversation and, and, and in that conversation, we start communicating poorly, but then we realize we're communicating poorly with one another. It wasn't an open session. This isn't ugly. Um, but we were, it was about an, an issue that we're passionate about. And we both took a step backwards and we both then regrouped and we re-engaged in our conversation because of the way we love and respect one another, that we can do that. And that we don't, and we don't walk away with hard feelings or I didn't walk away thinking, wow, Lori was mad at me. No, I walked away thinking Lori's passionate about what she's talking about and I need to do what I can to help direct that passion so that we can accomplish what we're trying to accomplish, even if we both have different ideas about the way to get there. Well, that's what respect and love um, are all about. And so um, I, I share that, Lori, and I hope I didn't violate anything uh, um, on your part because I say that to share with this group that this is what love and respect um, is all about. Um, I think one of the things that as I thought about talking today um, and reflected on my, my life a little bit, I thought about how I've struggled over the years listening to God. I, ta I, I thought about the fact that because maybe it's because of just kind of who I am, but also what I've chosen to do. I've been in fields where um, you have to take control. I don't mean to be melodramatic, but there are those many situations where you have to take control and make decisions or people literally die. Um, and so um, I think about my makeup as one of, of typically being in control. And here I have a responsibility um, as a child of God to listen more. And I haven't always been really good at listening to God. And I encourage everybody um, here, even when we get caught up in our business and, and, and we're in these lead roles or we're CEOs or we're supervisors or whatever those roles may be, that we remember that we are not the ultimate supervisor, that we're not the ultimate CEO, and that we actually need to pause and listen. We need to listen to what God says, and that sounds a lot different to a lot of us. It's more clear to some, 
Um, I will admit, I have never had that, oh, God spoke to me last night and said this, this, and this. God is more subtle in the way he speaks to me. God moves me and pushes me and prods me, and I wish that he would actually speak to me. I wish he would speak more clearly. I wish he would be more direct with me, but he's not. He's chosen not to be with me, not to say he never will, but he's chosen not to be direct with me. He whispers to me so I can barely hear it. Sometimes I can't even hear it, but I'm being poked and prodded and pushed in directions and I fight often and I have fought most of my life. But it seems that every time I've actually listened is when the best things in life have happened to me. But that's not to say that being a Christian makes everything good. That's not to say that being a Christian business owner means your business is going to thrive while the non-Christian business owners is not going to thrive. In fact, I would submit that it is a bigger challenge and that by being followers of God, that we have to work harder, that we're going to suffer greater, and that it's not always going to be perfect. It's kind of like when I look at marriage. Marriage needs to be, I believe, that we need to look at marriage and focus on creating a holy marriage, not a happy marriage. Recognizing that there will be ups and downs, there will be ebbs and flows, but if we focus on holy first, always, then I believe we will be doing what God wants us to do, and we will be glorifying him by doing so. Well, I believe as, as business owners, as CEOs, as supervisors, as peers, as workers, whatever role we're in, that we have that same obligation to be holy as a business leader and not focus on just being happy or being wealthy, but focus on being holy and the rest will take care of itself. And then we will ultimately see what God's plan really is for us because we can think we got this figured out all we want. And I'll tell you what, every time I start to get cocky and think I've got it figured out, God throws me for a loop. Just, I think, sometimes to remind me who is in control because it ain't me. And so I just, I share that with you, not to add, ju not to be judgmental of you because everybody's in a different place. But these are some of the things that, that I've learned and that when I, was really giving thoughtful consideration to sharing with you guys. Um, I wanted to share what God put on my, on my heart. I will tell you that, uh, and I'll, I'll throw it out there. Um, I struggle with faith. Um, some of you may not at all. Some of you may be as rigid and as solid as can be, but I, I struggle with faith and I get down on myself and I, and I think, how can I sometimes struggle with faith? Well, why? Because I'm a guy that needs to touch and feel it. If there's a door in front of me, I want to kick it, throw a flashbang, and put people in jail. That's what I want to do. That's something tangible. I can touch it. I can feel it. Um, I can't always, in the secular human sense, touch and feel God. It's, it's much more subtle. And, and so I have, um, over the years and at different times, struggled with my with my faith. And, and, I, and I share that with you just to bear my soul and say that if you ever have those moments, I think that's okay too. And I think those are those times when we just need to, to dig deeper and, 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 and pray harder. Um, that's something that I didn't even write in my notes, but I will tell you, I've never been a real good prayer. Um, and for years, I was that guy who would say, oh, that sad thing happened. I'll pray for you. Do you know, oftentimes I didn't. I said it. I meant it. You know where the road to you know where is and what it's paved with. And, and now I have absolutely, to the point where I even put a, and I, I'm almost feel silly telling you this, but I have an alarm that goes off weekly to pray for our community, to pray for our church, because I'm not intentional enough. And so if I'm going to try to create a habit, and I don't want it to just be a habit for habit's sake. I want it to be part of my core, but I've realized that even at 53 years old, I'm not the world's best prayer. Um, I talk to God in the non sort of prayer form, and I think he gives me credit to a degree for that. I figure if I'm talking to him, I'm praying. But, but I'm trying to be more intentional about prayer because I'm learning over time and, and over my battle with cancer that I had a few, five years ago now, um, about a two-year battle with cancer that I had, um, I really saw what legitimate prayer does. I saw prayer warriors praying for me, and I absolutely believe that that influences God, that when people raise folks up in prayer and they are very intentional about it 
and sincere about it, that miracles do happen. I don't think we see people walking on water every day these days or healing the lepers, but I think miracles are happening every single day. We need to open our eyes. And if we open our eyes to them, we'll actually see them. If we listen a little more intently, then we're going to take people like me who struggle with faith now and then, and we're going to twist that around so that all of a sudden we're not because we're recognizing that God is active and working today like he always has been. It just looks a little different than it's described to us when, when those 12 got to, to walk with Jesus for a very, very short time. Um, I think that in the roles that we are in, I think that we have an opportunity to make an impact. And I think that we should, we should make sure that we're not afraid to. Um, I don't think that any of us um, should apologize for our faith. Um, I don't think we, we have to force our faith on anybody. I think that, uh, that we are called to, um, to disciple. I think we should be intentional about that. But I think that intentional takes on very different forms for different people. And so just because you're not that person that's out ver outwardly going to go up to every person you meet and say, hey, do you know who God is? Can I talk about God with you? That may not be something you're comfortable with. In fact, you may disciple and never even mention the name God. And I think that we all need to recognize that, that in the roles that we play in our community, in our families, in our workplace, that if we're intentional about discipleship, that although it's going to take on many different forms, look many different ways, that that is what's going to change people's hearts. That's going to work on the coldest of people, the hardest of hearts, because they're going to see, wow, something is different about them. There is a calm about them. There is a comfort about them. I don't want to die. But I got to tell you, I'm living to die. If I really believe what the Lord has told me, then I am actually, I should be looking forward to that day. Now, I'm not trying to hurry it along. Don't get me wrong. I am not. But I do believe that there should be a peace that we can have that others can't even imagine. I saw that when my grandfather died. And so now I'll share the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. My grandfather drove away and never came back to Indiana but he went to California and after being in Skid Row, almost dying and then being in a year long um, recovery program, he never drank again till the day that he died. He re-engaged with God and he never separated again till the day that he died. And when my grandfather died, my mom and her two brothers were heartbroken and they were, they were emotionally beat down and distraught that their dad was dead. And I will tell you, I cried. I was sad. I'm still sad thinking about my grandfather being gone. But I will tell you that I had a comfort that nobody else seemed to have because I knew my grandfather was right with God. I knew where my grandfather was, and he was seated at the right hand. He was sitting right where he was supposed to be, even though he struggled with demons his whole life. But you know what? He played an important role in me. And so this guy, who would be looked at like the rest of the world as a failed drywall contractor, who was a honky-tonk singer, who was a drunk, who had two failed marriages, who left his grandson, is probably the most influential man in my life ever and always will be because of the good lessons that he taught me. And, and so I am so thankful that, that, again, God had his way. My grandfather was supposed to go through those struggles to teach me some of those lessons along the way. And thankfully, I have never had a dependency problem, thank goodness, yet so many people in my family have. And so I'm thankful for the lessons that, uh, that, he, uh, that he taught me. I'll, uh, I'll shift gears a little bit, sorry about that. Um, I'll shift gears just a little bit. We have a couple more minutes before I, I promised I'd end right around 1245, so we'd have some time for questions and wrap up, and I'm trying to be sensitive to everybody's uh, everybody's time. Um, so I will at least talk, touch just really briefly on, um, on COVID-19. Um, and then I'll kind of wrap up with our community. Um, but, uh, and certainly you can ask any questions that, that I might be able to answer, but I just, I will share with you that this is a unique situation. Um, it's unique to all of us, but especially those of us in, a, in emergency management, 
Um, and in my 32 years of literally, um, I was there for the LA riots. I was there um, for riots, floods. I was there for protests with 500,000 people. I was there for the Democratic National Convention. I was there for, for, for multiple Academy Awards and things like that. I've been here for hurricanes and floods. But this is a unique incident that we're managing here now. Emergency management and crisis management doesn't change. I mean, it's about preparation, response, assessment. It's about building relationships. It's about resource management. It's about all those things. And, and I will tell you that part of the reason that we have done well in large part as a community is because our relationships are strong with our partners in the state, the county, our region in general, and in our community are like hand in glove. And that is why we respond so well with whatever the situation is. But this, this one has been protracted. It's been, um, it's been unusual. Um, it's been like, like the one that will never end. It, it just kind of, kind of lingers, um, lingers on. And, um, and, and it, it's just, it, it's unusual. And um, that's all I can tell you. And, um, but what I can say is that because of our relationships, um, we have been able to address everything that we've faced. Um, we are prepared um, for every eventuality that may come our way. The biggest challenge, I believe right now, looking at where we've come to, how we're progressing wisely as we reopen our, con our economy, but that is how do we respond as a city from a budget and economy standpoint? And then I think of you, and how you as business members respond. Um, that is the biggest challenge for all of us. And that's where we all have to lock arms and do everything we can to support each other and support this community and get this economy back engaged, back moving, so that we suffer as little as possible. There will be sacrifice for everyone. What I would like is to reduce suffering to sacrifice and not have us lose businesses and and have people have to file bankruptcies and things like that. So I can I can assure you that anything that um, that I can do personally that we can do as a community to direct people to to guide people to support people um, we're going to continue to do that. And we as a city are going to continue to be fiscally responsible and wise as we move through this because we don't have a model. We don't know how steep the trajectory is and we don't know how long it's going to last but we need to be wise and we need to be prepared for that. And, um, and we are. And what I'll leave you with before we go to questions is just, I did come after about 26 years stint in, in Los Angeles area. Um, I came from a place that is different. It's not bad, but it's certainly different than Tomball, Texas. And I will tell you that, that as we're here, it can sometimes be easy for us to take for granted what we have here. And so what I would encourage you to do is not take this place for granted. This is a special place. We are surrounded by special people. Um, we actually love each other and it shows in everything we do. And so I would just, again, I would, I would encourage you not to be afraid to acknowledge that we are special, not to be afraid to acknowledge that God is specifically and intentionally at work in our region in a incredibly positive way. Um, I will tell you that, uh, that, uh, that, that he is not us, although we absolutely have a role, that he is the rock that will keep this nation great, that will keep this state great, this county great, and this city great. And so I just, again, I thank you so much for allowing me to just share a little bit about my story and my walk with God that certainly hasn't been the poster child for how to be a Christian, but it's been my way as how to be a Christian, how to develop a relationship with God and how to try to be the best disciple that I could be as I'm learning each and every day and still growing in my faith walk every single day. So thank you guys very much. And if you have any questions, I'd certainly be more than willing to answer them. Rob, uh, first of all, we know, we know why you made the decision to, uh, come to Texas, it wasn't a coincidence. But but I have a question for you. You're not a Dodgers fan, are you? I like the Dodgers. <laughs> um, but <laughs> <laughs> so I like the Dodgers, always have. 
Um, and, uh, and, my, and my claim to fame is a YouTube video of me as a Los Angeles police officer running down a guy who ran onto the field at Dodger Stadium, mooned John Rocker, and then I chased him down and tackled him in front of 40,000 fans and however many were on television. So if you ever want to see that, I have that video on my phone because it is my claim, my claim to, to fame. Um, but, uh, but I did make a decision when I, came, when I came to this area that I was all in. And so I am a Rockets, Texans, Astros, and even Dynamos fan because I decided when in Rome, be a Roman. And so there you have it. <laughs> so I, I'm trying to figure out how to get uh, all the people back on the screen and not minimize for all. How do I do that? Back up to your right corner, hover over that little matrix looking thing, and it'll go back gallery view, and then you'll be able to see everybody. Ah, thank you. Okay, very good. So everybody, uh, if, if anybody has a question for Rob, if you would unmute yourself and talk, um, you, you can do that. And so we'll open up for questions. Um, this is Laurie Klein. Uh, uh, Rob, you know I love you. And no, I'm glad that you brought up our discussion last night. That the passion that you have and your story, I know that you love this town, that you want what's best for it. And sometimes people don't always agree. But the fact that I know that you love Jesus, you know I love Jesus, that's what makes good in you. And we are so fortunate in this town to have so many people that love Jesus. And I think that that's why Tomball has been blessed the way it is. And we will continue to be blessed. And so, no, uh, I still love you. That doesn't mean I always agree, but I still love you. <laughs> Don't worry about that. <laughs> now, every time that we're facing the pandemic, the, the issue in front of you, uh, all of the things that we're facing in our lives, we just need to know that none of these issues are bigger than the God within us. The God within us will take care. And we pray. Um, it would, the KSCJ has a pray down at high noon where they pray the Lord's Prayer every day at noon. I don't know if y'all listen to that radio station. I like um, Christian gospel, but it is a pray down at high noon. It may be fun if we started as a city. Uh, pray down at couldn't agree more with him about the love of Christ in this community and, and the, the Lord is working here in this community and that he and I have spoken many times about the specialness of this uh, city and how much we love it. And, but I just wanted to thank him for the talk and this opportunity to be a part of this call. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and I also mentioned that this uh, this whole session has been recorded. So if you know anybody that uh, that missed today and wants to hear uh, Rob's comments, which were awesome, Rob, thank you. Uh, it'll be recorded, and uh, hopefully Jeanette will figure out a way to get it up on our uh, on our website. And we'll also probably send a link around to everybody with the, with the email announcements that we send out. And, uh, so so. Uh, We've, we'll figure out more than likely our, our uh, next meeting will be via Zoom again. Uh, but hopefully in July, we're going to find a way to get back together and, uh, and get the dogs to come out. We'll get Hank and his dogs to come out and uh, do it at Church 137. If anybody hasn't seen it, uh, it's pretty awesome. So, so everybody stay safe. And uh, again, Rob, I want to thank you. Uh, 
Tim, thanks for opening us up in prayer. And I uh, want everybody to uh, just, just have a great week. If there's no more questions. I'm going to go ahead and end, uh, and end it here.